Good, uh, then welcome back to our EFT lecture. Um, let us begin by writing down some observations from our exercise sheet. So you have all done very well the exercise sheet on basic Feynman diagram construction and Feynman diagram calculations. And uh, three observations which are important for the rest of our semester here are as follows. So from the first exercise where you had to draw simply Feynman diagrams, we uh, had a particular uh, attention to where are there heavy particles in the Feynman diagrams. And the answer is heavy particles can appear in a variety of ways. They can appear at tree level. For example, in diagrams which look like this, where you have external light particles and a heavy internal particle, for example, a Z boson or a Higgs boson would behave like this. They can appear in loops and there could be purely heavy loops or mixed loops like for example a diagram for muon decay uh, would be like this where we have here a top bottom loop and then the top quark might be considered as heavy and the bottom quark would be considered as light. So here we have a mixed loop with one heavy and one light particle. And of course, there are also many Feynman diagrams where we have purely heavy loops. Uh, one example would be a top quark loop in a photon propagator or a muon loop in a photon propagator for a very low energy process. So we had all these examples and it is good to keep in mind that the heavy particles can appear in all these different ways and that gives rise to different physical influences of the heavy particle onto low energy observables. The second very crucial observation is that uh, about Feynman rule vertices. Uh, the Feynman rule vertices are derived from the interaction Lagrangian and the interaction Lagrangian um, has a coefficient and the coefficient um, will become the Feynman rule of a vertex. And the coefficient is either as a numerical constant or a polynomial in the momenta if the Lagrangian contains derivatives. Lagrangian can only contain a finite power of derivatives and therefore in a Feynman rule we can only get a polynomial of finite degree in the external momenta. So let's write it like this. So some vertex can be at most a constant or a polynomial in the external momenta. And that corresponds to derivatives in a local Lagrangian. So if you would have a non-local Lagrangian which contains, let's say, integrals over some kernel functions which depend on x, then the Fourier transform of these kernels would appear in the Feynman rules and then we would have some non-polynomial function. Um, and if you have an interaction Lagrangian which is local and doesn't contain derivatives, then we simply get a constant as the Feynman rule. But for local Lagrangians, the Feynman rules are always polynomials and uh, no other functions. Then uh, the third observation now goes in the direction of EFTs and here we looked specifically at the case where we have a tree level appearance of a heavy particle which then automatically uh, looks like this and uh, the exact dependence of this Feynman diagram on the momenta is a rational function in the momenta but we can approximate the rational function by a polynomial because we can do a Taylor expansion and the Taylor expansion has a non-zero radius of convergence. So this can be approximated by a 
are you a Taylor expansion? And this Taylor expansion has a finite, in particular, non-zero radius of convergence. And then you see that after you do a Taylor expansion, you uh, can approximate the Feynman diagram by a polynomial in the external momenta, because a Taylor uh, polynomial is a polynomial, and therefore this becomes um, of the same mathematical structure as such a vertex, and that means that you can approximate these Feynman diagrams by new Feynman rules corresponding to a local Lagrangian. And that gives rise to effective field theories. Yep. So the opposite kind of expansion where the momenta are large and the mass is small, such approximations exist as well and there can also be a finite radius of convergence for these situations. And this can also be described maybe by some particular EFTs. However, in the majority of the lecture in this semester we will focus on this case where the mass is heavy and the energies are small. But you are right, the opposite expansion is also of interest. Um, but uh, we will maybe cover it uh, later in the semester. Okay, uh, other questions to these points? So these are uh, is a collection of observations from the exercise and uh, let us now come to the real first topic of the lecture, namely on actual construction of EFTs. Um, are you ready? Okay, let us, let us begin. Then our first chapter is effective field theory at three level. So we have already announced that the general situation that we want to analyze using effective field theories um, is that an EFT provides us with an understanding of the behavior of quantities, physical observables, or more general quantities in limits, where we have a separation of energy scales, or mass scales, or momentum scales. So in general, you have maybe some a set of momenta, let's call them PK, and a set of masses, let's call them capital MK, which are all much bigger then another set of momenta pi and masses mi. And here that contains the case that you just mentioned. Uh, some momenta are big, uh, bigger than maybe some masses. Uh, and in general, you can have all sorts of collections of masses, momenta. And you might even consider limits where uh, you do not just uh, generally treat uh, all momentum components as being equal, but you could say, uh, an angle is small or an angle is large, which means that uh, the p square is very, uh, very small, but the individual components of p mu are very large, but they cancel out when you form p square. So you could also look at such limits, which are more complicated than the limits that we look at right now. Uh, namely, uh, we will only look at the case at the moment where some masses are big and everything else is small. I will write this down in a second. So, but the main point is uh, always such effective field theories are therefore descriptions of physical phenomena which are appropriate in a certain limited energy range. They are not uh, arbitrarily valid, but they are valid in a certain range of energies or masses. So they are appropriate for a restricted set of phenomena. And also, as we have seen uh, here, if you approximate the Feynman diagram by a Taylor expansion, um, it uh, becomes a polynomial if you truncate the Taylor expansion. 
If you do not truncate, then it's not a polynomial. But if you truncate the Taylor expansion, then it becomes a polynomial and you can represent this diagram by such a new Feynman rule. But because you do a truncation, of course your approximation is not perfect anymore. You make a mistake corresponding to uh, the neglected higher order terms in your Taylor expansion. And therefore an EFT is also not only appropriate for a restricted set of phenomena, but also uh, it only is able to approximate the true result with a certain level of accuracy. You can make the accuracy as high as you want by going to higher and higher orders, but since you will never take infinitely many orders, uh, the approximation is never perfect. We systematically neglect press terms beyond a certain order. Okay. So this is the general picture. Now indeed what we do here is this special case where we have a set of heavy masses or one heavy mass scale that we call capital M, which is much bigger than all the other masses, all the light masses, uh, which we will call small m, and much bigger than all particle momenta of the physical particles that we consider in our physical processes. And uh, since the particle momenta of all physical processes are small, uh, heavy particles cannot appear in our processes because heavy particles, by definition, have large energies. Therefore, uh, we can only consider processes with light particles as external states. light external particles with small momenta. Okay, and uh, the purpose of this chapter here is, the, even though we work only at three levels or at a crude approximation, but we will explicitly see that it is possible to approximate a fundamental and exact theory with heavy particles by an effective field theory where the heavy particles are integrated out or where they don't exist anymore. And we will realize all these statements, namely uh, it will be a well-defined, not perfect, but accurate approximation where we systematically neglect terms of a specific order that we have predefined. And uh, therefore we can approximate our full physics by an arbitrarily uh, desired accuracy. So let's write this down. We want to show the existence of an effective field theory by a few well-selected examples. And I will also illustrate here several very important general strategies and features which have to do with technical terms like power counting, with ambiguities, and field redefinitions, and with locality predictivity and renormalizability. And uh, these terms appear already on your exercise sheet, so during the lecture today we will start um, analyzing and understanding what I mean by this. 
and uh, I will explain it for sure at the end of the lecture. Okay, having uh, given you the goals and the outline, let us start with the simplest example. at least some simple example, the simplest we will do, which is defined as a quantum field theory for scalar particles without spin, and uh, a field theory which contains one heavy particle and one light particle, and uh, only scalar interactions. So it's written like this, one half times d mu L, where L stands for a light scalar field, minus m square over 2 l square. This would be a mass term and a kinetic term for a light scalar field. Then plus 1 half d mu capital H square minus capital M square over 2 h square. H stands for another real scalar field. And uh, this is the kinetic and mass term for such a real scalar field. And here the mass is assumed to be heavy, and uh, that's why we call the field H standing for heavy. Then we have interaction terms, and then there is, first of all, some potential V of L, which we do not uh, need to know more precisely. It contains maybe L cubed and L to the fourth terms. Then minus lambda 1 over 2, L times H square minus lambda 2 over 2 L square times H minus lambda 3 over 6 H cube. This is the Lagrangian, and um, you could imagine even simpler examples than this, but I would say this is the simplest example that I want to consider. It has already three different uh, interaction terms here involving the heavy field. So discussing the terms. Here there is a term which uh, is just a self-interaction of the heavy field with itself. Here an interaction of heavy with two light particles and here two heavy with one light particle with three different coupling constants. So just to write this down, these are both real scalar fields. And now let us write the Feynman rules. for this theory. It contains, first of all, Feynman rules corresponding to the free part of the Lagrangian, which gives the propagators. So there are two particles, two fields, giving rise to two propagators. And there is one propagator for the heavy field, H. Heavy is uh, thick, light is thin. And this propagator has the rule I divided by P square minus capital M square because of this mass term. And there is another rule for the light propagator, which is I divided by P square minus the light mass square. So that can be read off from the Lagrangian. And now let's look at the interaction. So these interactions we don't care about at the moment. Let's write the Feynman rules for the three interactions involving the heavy field. And then the first one contains one light and two heavy fields. L, H, H. And it comes from this term. And what is the Feynman rule for it? It is I lambda. Yep. So the one half drops out. And we get this. Then the next is uh, the opposite. Two heavy, uh, no, sorry. Uh, two light and one heavy. And the Feynman rule analogously is minus I lambda 2. And uh, then we have a third Feynman rule. What uh, does this term correspond to? Which kind of Feynman rule? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so three heavy lines, and the rule is what? Minus right, and uh, the six cancels because we have three factorial uh, possibilities of permutations. 
that cancels exactly the one over six. So here we have our Feynman rules, and now we can calculate physical processes. And uh, our goal is to study the case where the mass is heavy, uh, much heavier than all the momenta of all the light particles, and uh, therefore we look now at the physical behavior of the light particles. We look at processes involving only light particles as external states and assume that the momenta of the light particles are small, but in the diagrams there may appear heavy lines. And then we do some approximation and want to show the existence of an effective field theory which describes the same physics, but without the heavy particles. And we will discuss such uh, details here. Let me just clean the blackboard. And consider the heavy contributions to an L process. And we work purely in three level. I will not always stress it, but we will uh, never use any loop diagrams also on the exercise sheet. So the simplest process that we can think of would be two particles in the initial state and two particles in the final state. And then there is such a Feynman diagram, LL going into LL, and in the virtual line, we have a heavy particle appearing. Okay. Where does this come from? It comes from this Feynman rule here, where two light particles couple to a heavy particle. Can you imagine a Feynman diagram where this vertex contributes to such an LL to LL process? You cannot. Not at tree level. Right. At loop level, there would for sure be such Feynman diagrams, but at tree level, there isn't. So uh, this would be a tree level contribution. And let us write down the amplitude. Uh, now we need to know how the Feynman rules work. So here we get um, two vertices. Each vertex brings in a factor minus i lambda 2, so we get this factor squared. And uh, we have the propagator. The propagator depends on the momentum which flows through it. And by momentum conservation, uh, we need to specify that here we have incoming momenta p1, p2. Let's also say here p3, p4. Let's count them here as incoming, all of them. Uh, they may be negative if they are actually outgoing, but uh, let's count it like this. Then in this propagator, we have the momentum P1 plus P2, the sum of the two, and we get I divided by the sum P1 plus P2 overall squared minus the capital mass square. That's, this is the result for the Feynman diagram. Let us uh, use the abbreviation always for such a square, um, P12 square, 
would be exactly the sum squared to have a nice abbreviation. Then uh, what we state is that uh, the momenta here are small. And because they are small, in the sense that they are much smaller than the heavy mass, we can do again here a Taylor expansion. Now a Taylor expansion of this fraction converges. And uh, let us do this approximation. And then the result becomes as follows. Let's work out minus i squared times plus i. That gives minus 1 times i minus i overall times lambda 2 square. And then uh, at zeroth approximation, the momenta can be neglected. And at zeroth approximation, this simply becomes 1 over minus the mass square. That is then the propagator. So the lowest order approximation would be this constant. That's all. So the diagram is approximated by a numerical constant. But we can go to higher orders in the Taylor expansion. And then if we go to higher orders and we factor out minus m square in the denominator, then the denominator gets a factor 1 minus momentum square divided by m square. So we get simply times a geometric series 1 plus this p12 square divided by m square plus p12 to the fourth power divided by m to the fourth power and so on. It is a geometric series. And so we can go to as high orders as we want. All the um, Taylor terms are well defined. But at some point, we truncate and stop the expansion. And then uh, we get a polynomial dependence on the momentum. Um, if we are serious about the physical process, then we need to ask, is this the only Feynman diagram which contributes to this uh, LL to LL process from the theory? Or are they, yeah. Yes, T channel and also U channel. There are exactly these three different channels, which means that we can combine 1, 2, or 1, 3, or 1, 4. These are the three possibilities. There is exactly these three and nothing else. And so therefore, this diagram appears basically three times, corresponding to the three possibilities where we combine the four into groups of two. Let me just write it uh, similarly. Uh, there are the diagrams which would look like this. So that would be a T-channel diagram with 1, 3, 2, 4, and a U-channel diagram with 1, 4, and 2, 3 connected. And they are obtained by simply replacing P12 square by either P13 square or P14 square in this notation. So wherever you see here this sum of P1 plus P2, you would then have P1 plus P3 or P1 plus P4. Everything else is the same. And uh, the sum of these three contributions would be really the full contribution of the heavy particle to the process. Then, after this calculation, we can write down a result at finite order in this uh, variable pi square divided by capital M square. So first of all, let us stress again the structure which emerges the structure is that we have approximated our diagram by a polynomial in the external momenta. It is a polynomial in all the external momenta, E1, 2, 3, 4. And depending on where we truncate, it is a polynomial of zeroth order, second order, fourth order, and so on. 
um, if we have an expression which is a polynomial in momentum space, this always corresponds to something which is local in position space by Fourier transformation. So that is also important to keep in mind. That is local in position space. That corresponds to the remark before. If you have a local Lagrangian, which contains fields multiplied at the same space-time point x, maybe with one or two derivatives, then the Feynman rule corresponding to it is a polynomial in the external momenta. So, but now let us construct our effective field theory. The claim is now that uh, the sum of the three Feynman diagrams can be replaced by yet another Feynman rule without heavy particles, which nevertheless gives exactly the same analytical result. Namely, the following. Simply a Feynman rule like this, where four L particles coupled together at one point, and we have incoming momenta P1, P2, P3, P4. And this Feynman rule should have the following value, minus i lambda 2 square over minus m square times 1 plus p12 square over m square plus and so on, plus another 1 plus p13 square over m square plus and so on, plus another 1 plus p14 square over m square plus and so on. And you see in this way, if that is our ansatz for the Feynman rule, then it is exactly the sum of the three Feynman diagrams here on the left. You see the zero order term in the first line, we have exactly reproduced this one here, right? But for each diagram, we get the same structure of terms. For each diagram, we get the one plus something else. So if you work at zeroth order, then the sum of these three diagrams is simply three times this prefactor like in our ansatz here. So this Feynman rule at zeroth order would be that prefactor times three. And that is the same as the sum of the three diagrams. At the next order, our diagrams here produce P12 square over M square, plus the same with P13 and P14. And that is reproduced here by those Feynman rules as well. And of course, we could go on and write here the next order term and so on. So we can, with this uh, ansatz for a Feynman rule, reproduce the sum of the original diagrams as well as we want to a fixed uh, order in an expansion of momenta divided by the heavy mass square. Now the question is, does this Feynman rule actually correspond to a local Lagrangian of some quantum field theory? So we work backwards compared to the normal situation. Can this Feynman rule be represented or can it be derived from some local Lagrangian? In principle, we should say yes, of course, obviously, but um, it's maybe not completely obvious uh, because this um, particular combination of momenta which appears here, one might ask, can it really follow from a Lagrangian in precisely this combination of all the four momenta appearing in this particular form where we have the sum of these particular sums of momenta squared? So how can we represent exactly? So the three might be simple to represent, but that might not be so simple to represent. Um, let us write down the solution. Of course, there is a solution. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be here, you know that, but uh, let's begin. So the EFT Lagrangian now uh, should reproduce the Feynman rule, and let me start by writing down a prefactor minus lambda 2 square over uh, minus m square. So this is the prefactor that we always had, and obviously we can put this as a prefactor in the Lagrangian. Now, uh, your turn. What 
term in the Lagrangian reproduces the zeroth order approximation. So if you only want to have the zeroth order, you have here that times three. So you should write down a Lagrangian whose corresponding Feynman rule is three times that and uh, corresponds to a vertex with four external lines corresponding to the L particle. Which term could that be? Yeah. Could be the product of the four fields. So L to the fourth power. Any prefactor? Three. Any other prefactor? So that already stands here. So minus lambda two square over minus m square times three over four factorial times L to the fourth power. Let's try it. Okay, let's just look at it and uh, do the normal derivation. If we take this term, derive the Feynman rules, then what happens? We derive the Feynman rules. L to the four means we have a vertex with four lines. That is okay. We take four times a derivative with respect to L that cancels the four factorial. That is cancelled, but the three remains and gives exactly the three that we need. And here this prefactor uh, gives that and the I um, comes on top of uh, the term from the Lagrangian. So the answer is yes, this works. This is exactly the term which reproduces the zeroth order approximation. And so here we have constructed already an effective field theory which reproduces the sum of the full diagrams at zeroth order in the momentum expansion. Very nice. And uh, so one could work out three divided by four factorial. This is one over eight. And you could keep that in mind. Uh, that might become important later on. But let us uh, look at the second term. Now th that is much more difficult. And uh, luckily we did some training in the exercise where you already got some experience that if you have some derivatives in the Lagrangian, it corresponds to momenta in the Feynman rule. And uh, just to remind you, you uh, I times d mu becomes the incoming momentum in the Feynman diagram. So, and uh, as a minus the box operator would become p square of the incoming momentum, right? Because you square this, then you get minus d'Alembert, and here you get plus p square. So here we want p square. Therefore, uh, this is maybe a good rule to know. So can you do something with this? Yeah? Well, I wouldn't be so pessimistic, but we can expand it. We can expand it. P1 square plus P2 square plus 2 P1 P2. Okay. So we, well, uh, we would still have an L square factor from the two other fields. Mm -hmm. um, according to the one divided by two sectorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so literally, if you, since you wanted it, let's complete this, okay? Then how would you get uh, P1 square? That would maybe be L times d'Alembert L. Then you have here one momentum from this line. Let's call it the line number one. Then this term would give us uh, minus, that would give us plus P1 square for one line times the other lines without momentum. How would you get the P2 square? So you would get maybe d'Alembert L times L. So then you might say this is the second line, gives P2 square times uh, the line without momentum. And how would you get this? Yeah. So plus two times d mu L times d mu L. 
right? And now I claim uh, you shouldn't have been so pessimistic because we can combine the three terms, actually. The three terms in the bracket are nothing but what? By some derivative chain rules and so No, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this uh, combinatorics comes later, but let us first um, simplify the bracket in order to yeah. this, uh, <laughs> the relative the prefactors don't match up. Is just applying to the Stellenberg terms, not to the uh, P1, P2 terms. So I think it is more straightforward to uh, include it now than later. Uh, I doubt it. Because anyway, uh, there are also the other terms with P1 plus P3 and P1 plus P4 squared. Mm -hmm. They also need to be taken into account and they will uh, change the combinatorical factors. Yeah. Mathematically, this here is equal to something much simpler uh, by virtue of the chain or product so rule. Product. Yeah. So it's simply d'Alembert of L square, isn't it? It's simply d'Alembert of L square. And then uh, this immediately gives you the rule that let's say d'Alembert of L square uh, produces uh, the square of the sum of the incoming momenta into two lines, exactly what we need for the Feynman rule here. So therefore we can express these terms in, in this way, d'Alembert L square, and then the only structure that we need is L square times d'Alembert L square. And that will produce those terms. And now, uh, after, um, let's say, understanding this point, we can discuss the combinatorical factors, I would say. Now let us discuss the combinatorical factors. Let me write down as an ansatz. Uh, so let's factor out the same prefactor. And then we would do the ansatz L square times minus d'Alembert divided by capital M square applied onto L square. And now the question is about the prefactor. But uh, regardless of the prefactor, if we now go back and derive from here the Feynman rule in the normal way, then uh, you can do it and compare with the desired outcome and in this way obtain the cor correct uh, prefactors. So if we derive the Feynman rule from here in the normal way, then how does it work and what do we get? Mm -hmm. So in momentum space, out of the minus box, we get what? Exactly, so this gets converted into exactly that, or that, or that. And so if you derive the Feynman rule, you have this uh, symmetrization to do, which uh, if you think of the Wick theorem, which is the origin of the Feynman rules in the derivation of perturbation theory, then you need to do all contractions of all fields in any way which is combinatorically possible. And then uh, out of this summation on all possibilities, uh, this will become the sum P12 square plus P13 square plus P14 square it will become the sum, and then the sum is even multiplied with some combinatorical factors, uh, which is your two factorial, because you can flip around these two fields without changing anything. This gives an extra factor two. You can flip around these two fields, which gives yet another factor of two. And then actually you can also swap the group of these two fields and the group of these two fields as well without changing anything and that gives another factor of two. So you get overall two to the third power, which is a factor eight. You get a factor eight multiplied with this sum of the three momenta. And therefore, we need to multiply by one over eight as a symmetry factor. And then this term in the Lagrangian reproduces exactly 
um, the result that we want. And we see that we can indeed find an effective field theory Lagrangian, namely this one, which including all combinatorics and all symmetry factors exactly reproduces the polynomial momentum dependence of the original Feynman diagram. Yeah, uh, exactly. So we can factor out here 1 over 8, and that becomes important later on. So it's good to know that actually both terms here have the same prefactor 1 over 8. But uh, at higher orders, I don't know. Yeah, at higher orders, we would need to figure it out step by step. Can be, can be. Uh, so if you have here higher powers of the box operator, you may very well be right. Okay, but um, uh, that is maybe the less important statement. Uh, let's uh, be happy at the moment with this. Uh, maybe I can write here plus dot dot dot, it could go on. So, but the sentence is that this describes the same physics at any order of pi square or pi j square divided by m square. So a very nice and powerful result. We have constructed our first effective field theory which reproduces uh, the dependence uh, of light observables on the heavy fields if we only look at this particular structure of Feynman diagram. Let us deepen the discussion of this simple example a little bit and uh, derive some comments which are a little bit general. Question? Ah, good point, yeah. Uh, I mean, then the question is, uh, under what conditions would you call a theory an EFT as opposed to non-EFT? And the borderline, uh, there is no uh, unambiguous borderline. One criterion that you can apply is uh, whether a theory is ultraviolet complete in the sense that it could theoretically be valid up to infinitely high energies without becoming mathematically inconsistent or inconsistent with quantum mechanical properties like uh, unitarity such that probabilities add up to one and stuff like this. Um, such a theory might be called ultraviolet complete and then you could say, okay, that for me is not an EFT but it is a candidate for a fundamental theory. And these theories here, they are not ultraviolet complete because we know for sure that at some high energies where uh, these fractions become bigger than one, the theory is definitely wrong. There's definitely uh, no good approximation to the truth and therefore it has a limit uh, in its applicability at high energies. And so uh, such a theory could uh, be called always a, an EFT. And uh, then the question is whether theories with derivative interactions could ever be ultraviolet complete and the answer is in principle yes. I gave you an example yesterday, namely a scalar QED, where you have a derivative interaction of a scalar field with a photon. That is a renormalizable gauge theory, which could be uh, theoretically ultraviolet complete. Uh, whether that describes nature is another question, but it intrinsically, it would be not necessarily an EFT. But we will say more about this, uh, and it has to do with the question of renormalizability as well, which we'll discuss for sure when we discuss loops.
So uh, let us spend a little bit of time on some uh, technicality, namely the so-called power counting. And uh, for us, this is connected with the question of units. In our EFT discussion, we will uh, always get um, power series in various quantities, in vertices and in momenta and so on. So it is very um, important to know and understand how the, uh, each individual ingredient of a Feynman diagram behaves. Uh, and uh, for that, the simplest thing is that you should know what is the unit and the dimensionality of the various quantities. Um, so let's first uh, make us aware of the units or dimensions. So uh, the first quantity is the action. What is the, the dimensionality of an action in quantum mechanics? It's zero mass sufficient. Yeah, right. So it has, so h bar is one. Therefore, an action has no unit. So let's say it's uh, energy or mass to the power zero. Then uh, that is good to know because then we can understand immediately what is the uh, uh, dimension of a Lagrangian density because the action is obtained from this by integrating over d4x. So the Lagrangian has the same dimension as one divided by length to the fourth power. In other words, it is energy to the fourth power or mass to the fourth power. So Lagrangian density has unit mass to the fourth. And uh, that uh, then we should also know what is the dimension of a derivative operator. So this is one over x is the same as mass. And now uh, first consequence. What is the uh, unit of all scalar fields? in a quantum field theory. You get it from looking at the kinetic term of the Lagrangian where we have two powers of phi and two powers of derivatives. So we know phi square times derivative square must have unit of mass to the fourth. Therefore, phi itself has unit of mass. Scalar field has unit of mass. And uh, we don't need it now, but let's say a Dirac spinor field would have which unit? There the kinetic term would be psi bar d slash psi. So one derivative and two powers of psi. That means psi has the unit mass to the two over three. Different unit. Now uh, we have only a scalar theory. And in our scalar theory, we did have a few parameters appearing lambda one lambda two, lambda three. What is actually the unit of our parameters lambda one, two, three? If you remember, they appeared in front of terms which contain a cube of scalar fields, three powers of scalar fields. So lambda has unit of mass. It is not a dimensionless number. So you should be aware of that. In contrast, the coupling constants in the standard model, they are dimensionless numbers, but our lambdas here are, um, have unit of mass. So that is the result of this small analysis. And that means, of course, when we say we work at small energies and uh, the mass of the heavy particle is heavy, but we have here some dimensionful quantities, we should uh, very well specify and know is this now a heavy mass or is it a light mass? And when the heavy mass goes to infinity, do these lambdas also go to infinity with the same scaling or do they remain small? And uh, anyway, we need to specify the behavior of the lambdas if we want to have a well-defined um, serious approximation. So that is a lesson. We should specify precisely the behavior when capital M goes to infinity. 
the, we say here lambda one, two, three behave proportionally to the heavy mass and also go to infinity. And here that is our choice. And we could do a different choice, but we choose for our lecture here that the lambdas are large, they correspond to the heavy mass to a large scale, and if the heavy mass goes to infinity, the lambdas all also go to infinity. That is the nature of the limit that we investigate, and other people could investigate other limits where, for example, m becomes heavy, but the lambdas stay small. That would simply be a different limiting process. But we have to make a choice, and that is important to know. So we have made our choice, and uh, after making this choice, we can now go back to our EFT Lagrangian that we called EFT, comma A, this one here. We have a structure which uh, has, let's say, let's call it C4 in the EFT times L to the 4, that is the first term here, L to the 4 times some coefficient, plus let's call it C61 EFT times L square d'Alembert L square. So uh, this is the structure of our Lagrangian and what is now the power counting of these terms? First let us investigate uh, the operators. So every term in the Lagrangian is a product of a field operator, construction, and a coefficient. So here we have L to the fourth, which is a field operator construction, a so-called composite operator, and the coefficient. And so here we have an operator of a certain dimensionality, and what is the dimensionality of the operator? It is a mass to the fourth power. So this is a so-called dimension four. operator. The Lagrangian has dimension 4 as well, so here we have a dimension less coefficient. And uh, not only is the coefficient dimensionless, but we can now investigate what is the power counting of the coefficient if the heavy mass goes to infinity. How does this coefficient behave in the limit m goes to infinity? It's constant because lambda 2 square over m square behaves like a constant. So this is order lambda 2 square over m square equal order m to the zero um, is a constant behavior. So this term does not go to zero in the limit that we consider. It goes to a non-vanishing constant, interestingly. How about here? So this is what kind of an operator? It has dimension six, it is a dimension six operator. Dimension six operator. And this coefficient here has uh, obviously unit one over mass square, but what is its behavior if the heavy mass goes to infinity? Does it behave like one over heavy mass square or does it behave like one over light mass square? How does it behave in the limit? With, yes, because here we have the extra one over m square and here this goes to a constant. So this behaves like order one over m square. Okay, and in this way you can analyze the power counting of every term in such an EFT Lagrangian. Every term consists of an operator with a certain dimensionality and you can sort the Lagrangian according to operators of higher and higher dimension. And the coefficients have a certain power counting in the limit that we consider. And so this can always be done. Now, let me summarize some comments. So we have derived an effective field theory 
just for one particular process. And in particular, we have shown that the EFT description actually is possible and reproduces completely also the non-trivial momentum dependence of the original diagram. The Lagrangian that we need to achieve this result depends, of course, only on the light field. So, and we can say that the heavy field has been integrated out. That is the slogan that you can uh, use and we will understand later where the term integrated out comes from. But anyway, the field doesn't exist anymore. Then a very important result is that the Lagrangian is local in terms of the light field. It contains derivative terms, but derivatives are also local. So the Lagrangian is local. But it uh, would contain um, infinitely many terms for infinite accuracy. So, and if we want to have only a finite number of terms, then we have only a finite accuracy. It contains uh, operators with dimension bigger than four and such operators make the theory non-renormalizable. We will come back to this term when we analyze renormalizability, um, but I do not yet assume that you know the theory of renormalization, therefore I will just comment on this. Every term which has an operator of dimension bigger than four is a non-renormalizable term, and this has an impact on the structure of divergencies in the theory. But even though this might sound negative, it is not really a problem for uh, the theory. Then there is the physical property of decoupling. So for the heavy mass going to infinity, we can analyze what happens. And uh, there are actually two different things that we can observe. In the limit where the heavy mass becomes infinite, uh, in the EFT, there has emerged a new structure, namely this renormalizable L to the four term with a coefficient which goes to a non-vanishing constant. So in this limit, uh, we get this additional effect in our theory. And that remains. So. Um, the coefficient of uh, dimension four term um, modifies the L to the four term present in V of L. Remember that, that at the beginning of our definition, we said that there is a potential V of L which just contains the light field and it may contain L to the four terms. We didn't care about them, but let's say they exist. Then our result here means that whatever L to the four term was there before, it is now modified by this additional L to the four term which comes from integrating out the heavy particle. So that means the L to the four operator um, is uh, modified and the modification describes the physical impact of the heavy particle. So this is often described as saying that the effects of heavy particles renormalize uh, low energy operators. So this is one effect. And the second effect is that uh, the coefficients of the non-renormalizable operators go to zero. And uh, so then, if we are really interested in the 
extreme limit where the heavy masses are infinitely heavy. What this uh, shows us is that we get back a renormalizable theory because all the non-renormalizable terms now vanish. And the renormalizable terms, they do not vanish, but they are modified numerically by the effects of the heavy particle. So uh, we can then say that for infinitely heavy particles, we just get uh, yet another renormalizable theory which just depends on light particles, but maybe with modified coefficients. But since we have to measure the coefficients experimentally anyway, that modification doesn't really matter. And in this case, the theory with infinitely heavy particles or without infinitely heavy particles describes exactly the same physics and uh, the same relationships between low energy observables. Um, and in this sense, the effect of heavy particles decouples, so the effect becomes unimportant. That is the decoupling theorem. Then, the next statement is at any finite order. In uh, Pij square over M square, we have only finitely many terms in the EFT Lagrangian, and that means we have predictivity. Because whenever a Lagrangian has only a finite number of terms, which uh, means that we have a finite number of free numerical input parameters in our theory. So all observables will become functions of the input parameters, which are the parameters in the Lagrangian. If there is a finite number of parameters, it means we should measure a finite number of observables. Then all the parameters are fixed from experiment. Then we can predict infinitely many other observables, and our theory is predictive and can be tested against experiment. That should be contrasted with the case where the Lagrangian contains infinitely many free parameters, so we would need uh, an infinite number of experiments to determine them, which is impossible. So a theory with infinitely many parameters is not predictive. A theory with a finite number of parameters is predictive, and our EFTs are predictive as long as we work at a finite order in the momentum expansion. And that means if we want to require a particular level of accuracy, then our theory is predictive at this level. And that is for us good enough. So, um, do you have any questions at this point? Yep. It would be ineffective. Uh, I would say yes. So a theory with uh, infinitely many parameters would not be effective because it's ineffective in the sense of describing uh, nature in a predictive way. Here you should distinguish two cases um, of application of the EFT. So here we have had the point of view that there exists a fundamental theory which we know, which depends on the lambdas, and then we derive the EFT as a low energy um, approximation to the fundamental theory. Since our fundamental theory has only three lambdas, all the uh, parameters in the EFT are determined in terms of the three lambdas. And in this sense, the EFT would be a predictive even if we have infinitely many terms because all of them are just functions of the lambda. So in that sense, our EFT is just a substitute of the fundamental theory with a fixed number of parameters and therefore it would remain predictive. Uh, this predictivity becomes important if you forget that there was a fundamental theory to begin with and you just look at the EFT itself. 
intrinsically study the EFT and compare it to experiment, and then you forget or have never known in the first place that the parameters of the EFT are functions of lambdas. They would just be coefficients C, whatever, C4, C6, C8, C10, and so on, infinitely many coefficients. And if you do not know where they come from, they are just three parameters. And that is where the theory would then become unpredictive. And so EFTs are indeed used also in practice in both of these ways. They can be used uh, where you know the fundamental theory and then you derive the EFT in this way where all the EFT coefficients are fixed and known. And then you can do physics applications with it or you do not know the fundamental theory and then you treat the EFT with free parameters. Both is important. If I take like a fundamental theory and I build an EFT um, from it, do I need for, for every process to build another EFT theory? The EFT would be a universal and it would describe all processes simultaneously correctly. That is the point and so we should discuss this also um, probably next time. Um, here we only see that it can describe one Feynman diagram or more precisely three Feynman diagrams, the sum of the three. Um, and uh, you might wonder whether if you calculate another process in the fundamental theory, uh, you should throw away this Lagrangian, but that is not the case. So you will be able to find a Lagrangian maybe with additional terms, uh, which then systematically and correctly describes all processes described by the fundamental theory. That is very important and uh, an important feature of uh, these EFTs. So they are uh, once they are defined, they universally apply to all processes. That is why it's really an approximation to a theory, not to one calculation of one process. It's a, an approximation to a theory. And we will understand why that is possible. So from here, it might not be obvious, but it will become obvious. Now the question is uh, what we should do next. Um, there are two items which we should discuss to understand the exercise sheet, but I think we have only time for one of the two. So let me make a quick decision. Um, maybe let's do the second one. Let me describe um, one thing that I will now skip, namely you could um, do the same discussion for this process L2 LLL, which uh, would give, uh, for example, this Feynman diagram, where we use here the other vertex, the lambda 1 vertex and two lambda 2 vertices, lambda 1, lambda 2 square and it would correspond to a process with five L's. And you could go through the same approximation and let me just write down the result. You will get L E F T B to describe this, which is proportional to minus lambda two square lambda one divided by mass to the fourth power times a symmetry factor times L to the fifth at zero order approximation. So it's a process with five L's and you get this coupling structure and this mass suppression because of the two heavy propagators. And you can do this calculation as an exercise including the symmetry factor. And that means you need to work out all the combinatorial permutations of this diagram which may be a lot. Then also uh, six L's, two L to six L, for example, this. One, two, three, four, five, six. So here you use the lambda three vertex with three heavy lines connected. So this would be proportional. Let's just write down the L E F T. which would be proportional to minus 
lambda 2 cube times lambda 3 divided by mass to the 6 times L to the 6th power. And again, I omit the symmetry factor. And uh, then, in total, all three level effects of H on L can be absorbed by this L EFT, which is the sum of this L EFT A, B, C, and so on, if you complete it by further examples. Okay, and you can do the calculation for this L to the fifth operator and check something. <coughs> 